So one of the biggest regrets of my spiritual life is that I never was able to get the personal association of the Mahakrishna Maharaj. But I did get a lot of his association through his books. So I'll focus. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a writer. So I read, I have read several times almost all of Maharaj's books. And I would like to speak about how I appreciate him immensely, primarily as a writer. So Maharaj, there's, I'll talk about four different kinds of books that he has written. And each, you know, there are, there are like fiction and non-fiction are two different kinds of books broadly. And writing a book in a particular genre and shifting to another genre, it's quite a complicated thing. It's not easy. So we, in our tradition, have mostly, all our books have been mostly non-fiction books. Prabhupada's books are like didactic, writing philosophy to explain to people. But there is a large number of people who read only fiction. They want to read stories. And Maharaj was the pioneer in using fiction in Krishna's service within our movement. So there is, some of you may have seen his book called The Science of Yoga, The Story of Lee Kong Shi. So this was a book where Maharaj expertly integrated uh, Krishna consciousness with Chinese patriotism. So when he, when he got that mandate to try to share Krishna consciousness in China, so this book is about Lee Kong Shi is a Chinese student who has come to America for studying and then he becomes a genetic scientist and he has opportunities to have a brilliant career in China, in America but then he meets uh, a, a spiritual master, that is Sanatan Swami and you can see Sanatan Swami is actually very very similar to Krishna Maharaj himself <laughs> and then he gets so inspired by him that he goes back to China and then he shares not just his knowledge of genetic engineering, but he shares the knowledge of spiritual engineering. And that book is so vividly written. I met one Chinese devotee and he told me that uh, his wife, she actually read Maharaj's book and she came to the temple, or we didn't have a temple, we have basically some kind of center. He came to the center, she, uh, she came to the center because she wanted to meet this Lee Kong Shi. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's how she, her spiritual journey started. So before that, Maharaj had never written any kind of fiction and yet he wrote a book which was, which is a masterpiece. In fact, I hope in future to sometimes write something similar, blending Indian patriotism and Krishna consciousness. <laughs> so, Many years I have, I have not written, writing fiction is very different from writing non-fiction, so I have never written that. So I seek the blessings of Maharaj for that purpose. So this was one genre. Another genre of his books was where he, some of you may have seen his book called Jagannath Priyanatakam. Now that book is, is basically you could say simply the, uh, the play of how Jagannath appeared in the world. With... Maharaj Indra Dhyumna and that story, but what he has done is something which is extraordinary, maybe even unprecedented. He has taken the rules of Sanskrit dramaturgy. Whenever drama that to be written, there are particular rules with which the drama that to be written. And Sanskrit has got quite elaborate rules. In fact, Natya is a very central part of our tradition. And Rupa Goswami has written a book called Natak Chandrika. Well, they, they have also wrote, written books on Natak. If you read Chaitanya Charita Amrath, it is said that a devotee, because at that time, 500 years ago, Kavya and Natak, drama and poetry, were very prominent in Bengal, Bengal and India. So Chaitanya Charita Amrath says that you know, a Vaishnava should be expert in both these things. So, what Maharaj has done is he has taken the rule, traditional rules of Sans Sanskrit grammaturgy and he has used all of them to tell the story of Jag Jagannath in English. 
So it's a, it's a way of carrying on the Sanskrit tradition into the contemporary world. And it, I, I read a scholar's, academic scholar's review of that book and he said that this is an extraordinary task to be able to actually do that to preserve a tradition in a different language. Just like say, if you translate the Bhagavad Gita into English, which the Prabhupada and many of Acharyas have done, the Bhagavad Gita is a poetry. But to make it into English poetry and to preserve the exact essence is very, very difficult. So Maharaj did that very expertly. Then, along with that, his... Uh, so this is also, in a sense, poetry bringing, that one was writing non-fiction, another is bringing Sanskrit poetry into English. The, that art form to preserve and carry it on. Of course, apart from that, he wrote several other books and uh, there was, he is also the pioneer within our tradition, uh, within, I would say at least in Iskon, of what you call as, you could call it as bhakti fiction. Bhakti fiction means that within the bhakti tradition in Atta Chandrika, Rupa Goswami says that you can have three kinds of characters. You can have aitihasik, that's historical characters. You can have kalpit, you can have you can say non-historical, fictional characters. And you can have historical and fictional characters. And both can interact and you can draw a story accordingly. So now Prabhupada's final pastime is one of the most uh, emotionally wrenching books. It's very uplifting, but it's also wrenching books where what <laughs> Maharaj has done is he is there is a, there are there's like a three level interaction going on. There is the in historical incidents that we know as they happened. And how Prabhupada in his last days he decided to stop eating food and he sent his body. Then at the begging of disciples, finally started taking his food again and then he wanted to go for a bullock car drive. So those incidents that are there, he has narrated them and then he's also envisioned over there a conversation between Bhakti Devi and Bhakti Devi and other characters who are actually acting in Krishna, according to Krishna's will to churn the hearts of the devotees so that Bhakti can emerge forth in the strongest, deepest way, sweetest way from their hearts. So now this is something which is, uh, which, which we don't have a vision of what is happening at higher levels of reality. But whatever is happening in our life, it's not just we struggling with situations. It's 12 So Krishna 30. is acting and how Krishna is acting in our lives, Maharaj has depicted that in a very beautiful way. So bhakti fiction means, it's not exactly fiction in the sense of imagination, it's more of a vision. And of course, his uh, life's greatest work was his doctorate thesis, a Living Theology of Krishna Bhakti. And that is completed by one of his goddesses, Garuda Prabhu, after his departure. And what Maharaj did was that it's also, it requires an enormous amount of dedication as well as humility. That he, we can broadly say that there are four different ways of communication that can be there. There can be insider, insider communication. There can be insider, outsider communication. There can be outsider, outsider communication. There can be outsider, insider communication. What do I mean by this? Let's say for example, if we have Bhagavatam classes in the temple. <coughs> it's insider, insider. Devotees speaking to devotees. So when we have outreach programs, like say devotees had organized a program in a company for in fish burners or wherever, that's an insider, outsider program. Now, in these two are what we do quite a bit and it's vital for us to educate devotees and to introduce new people. But society's perception of us is shaped much more by outsider, outsider communication. That means, People who are not committed to our movement, what do they think about us? People will want to know from us, but when we tell them something, hey, you are from this movement, you are always going to speak good only about this movement. You are going to promote this movement. But what do outsiders say about our movement? So outsider, outsider communication shapes people's perceptions enormously. 
Say for example, if somebody meets uh, Hare Krishna, people may Google and maybe look at Wikipedia, or Encyclopedia Britannica, or they're more serious, they might read a book on Hinduism, and there something might be told. So what do outsiders, not just outsiders, the street people, but influential outsiders think about us? And how we can reshape that? So we traditionally as a movement didn't care much for that. In some ways, we are quite uh, self-congratulatory. <laughs> <laughs> we are aspiring for pure devotional service and we pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> and of course things are changing now, but in the, that change, how it came, it didn't happen automatically. Maharaj is one of the pioneers in that. So, now how do we reshape the outsider outsider communication? We are, in one sense, insiders. So, how do we affect that? So, for that, there is a fourth mode of communication that is outsider insider. That means Maharaj actually went uh, into mainstream academia and he did his PhD. Why? The idea was to learn how outsiders think. We could just say they are materialistic people, they are atheistic, they are demoniac or whatever. It's easy to give such labels. But then we will label them as demoniac, they will label us as sentimental and there's no communication. So he went through that, uh, that whole uh, exercise and it was quite an exerting exercise. He was, uh, his, uh, I met his, uh, his, the, the, the scholar who was his PhD guide, I met him, so he said that when Maharaj would come to Iskon temples, you know, he like Vyas Puja would be there, you know, decide, devotees fanning him and offering him worship. But then same Maharaj would go to an academic classroom and sit on a small chair with many other students who were all much younger than him. But he, why did he do that? Because he felt that for our movement to spread in the western world, we need to reshape we need to first of all understand how people think and then we can explain to them our way of thinking and living in their language. So what Srila Prabhupada wanted the Bhaktivedanta Institute to do. The Bhaktivedanta Institute was an institute of scientific research, but it's not just scientific research, it's a general academic outreach. Prabhupada said you present our message in their language. So now to present it in their language, Maharaj went through the effort of learning the language. <coughs> Even from an ordinary perspective, you know, for somebody who is at 50, 55, 60, at that age, to actually start learning a new language is not easy. To start getting an academic degree at that time is not easy. But Maharaj did that and through that, uh, eventually what happened was that he has uh, helped create uh, he is a pioneer, a whole generation of second generation devotee scholars who are now creating an influential presence in the mainstream academia. In fact, there was a book on contemporary Hinduism and there they have given example of how uh, the Hare Krishna movement has the most vibrant academic presence in Hinduism. Most other organizations don't have, or Hindu organizations don't have that kind of presence. So Maharaj was the pioneer in that. And at that time, during his PhD thesis also he wrote many, many books. So one of his books was on religion, on, on faith and reason. So basically what he did through these books was, is he took the concurrent intellectual way of thinking and the traditional intellectual way of thinking and brought them into a dialogue. And through that, it's a completely new way. Through this, people may not become devotees. But what happens is people who are influential in the outer world, their perception changes. And when that perception changes, we are able to, our direct outreach also becomes much more receptive. So, now in his book, that, that is the book probably I have spent the most time reading. I have read it several times, The Living Theology. And it's... Uh, see, many devotees, uh, uh, many Prabhupada disciples are writing books. And it's, it's a very valuable way of continuing the, our legacy of writing. But that there is a writing as a craft and there is writing as an art. 
writing as a craft means say we all do writing as a craft we send whatsapp messages and we send we send emails so we all write but that is simply writing as a functional uh, as a functional activity that is just communicate something but writing can also be an art where sometimes you read something not just for the message that is being conveyed but for the beauty of the language for the exquisiteness of the way something is written so maharaj the way he would write was that he he when i actually in the academic books so his his book was probably among the uh, most captivating books for me so that book actually i had when i read that book i had many different thought but two main thoughts i had was that that maharaj is demonstrating how to use english in devotional service <laughs> <laughs> and secondly I felt that by the way he is presenting, he what Bhakti Sant Singh Thakur would do. Uh, Bhakti Sant Singh Thakur would often. Uh, one of my friends has done his PhD in in Bhakti Sant Singh Thakur. So Bhakti Sant Singh Thakur he showed a small pocket book of Bhakti Sant Singh Thakur, which was Bhakti Sant Singh Thakur's vocabulary book. So just like we sometimes learn word lists, so Bhakti Sant Singh Thakur would learn, and then he would while preaching to British people. would speak english better than them yes <laughs> and we just outclass them is uh, written english was so, so brilliant so tamal krishna maharaj has continued that legacy and of course within the mainstream movement he is the foremost uh, one of the foremost followers of shri prabhupad and uh, <clears throat> contributions directly in terms of hundreds and hundreds thousands of devotees being inspired by him that's that's very well known but this is a part of his legacy that is going to have a long lasting effect in terms of invoking and perpetuating the literary aspect of our tradition so we there are many devotees who are inspired many academically and intellectually literary oriented devotees who are inspired by maharaj even if like me they have never met him if they have never had his personal association but he has inspired this aspect of the, our legacy to by his own personal example and by his inspiration to be continued in this generation and for many future generations to come so let us tamam krishna maharaj ki jai shri prabhu pad ki jai